So I learned to dive in 1972, and in the four and a half decades that I've been a coral reef biologist, I've had the opportunity to see spectacularly beautiful reefs and catastrophically destroyed ones. And that contrast really came to a head in 2013, where I made two very different kinds of dives. On the one hand, I spent a month, actually, diving in the Southern Line Islands. These are uninhabited mm -hmm. islands. They have no people, therefore no pollution, no overfishing, and they look like this. You can see coral as far as the eye can see, and the water is full of groupers and turtles, snappers and sharks. In fact, there's so many sharks that you have to get out of the water by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon if you don't want to be on the menu. On the other hand, in 2013, I also, uh, at the request of the State Depart U.S. State Department, went to the Philippines. And while there, I was taken on a dive to this location you see on the right. Uh, this is a place that should look like the Southern Line Islands. It's actually the same sort of topography, as you can see, a rising slope. In fact, it should be even more spectacular because it sits in the Philippines, which is right in the heart of the Coral Triangle, the most diverse part of the ocean on the planet. And yet it looks like this. The bottom is covered with slimy seaweed. There are a few dying corals. Those little white spots are bleached corals. And in the entire hour of my dive, I saw not a single fish. Now, after that dive, uh, we were sitting on the beach drinking beer because, to be honest, we were a little bit shell-shocked, and, and a fisherman walked to the beach and started casting his net. And I asked my host, I said, what is that person catching? And he said, well, actually, they'd done studies, and then an artisanal fisher working for the, over the course of an hour could expect to reel in a catch with a caloric value of a can of Coca-Cola. So this is not a biodiversity crisis for a country like the Philippines. This is an existential food security crisis. Now, unless you think that we're doing better here in the developed world, here are two images about what we've been doing to fisheries in the uh, North Atlantic. And in this image, red is good and blue is bad. And you see the amount of fish taken out of the water in 1900, many areas of red with greater than 11 tons per square kilometer. And then by 2000, no red areas at all. In fact, no areas where we're taking more than three uh, uh, tons of seafood uh, per square kilometer. And of course, the future is also not looking too good, especially under a business-as-usual scenario. Uh, this is, you've seen now the data on temperature, and it was alluded in the previous talk talk about uh, ocean acidification and how carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean, making it more acidic. This again, red is good, blue is bad, and by 2080 to 2099, the ocean will be so acidic that it'll be very difficult for organisms like corals, but also organisms that we like to eat, like oysters and mussels, to lay down their skeletons, because an acidic ocean changes the chemistry of skeletal deposition and makes it much, much harder to do. So my husband, Jeremy and Jackson, and I have uh, been around long enough so that we've actually seen a lot of these changes unfolding in real time. And we have spent decades wandering the globe trying to raise the alarm about what was going on in the ocean. I used to give talks called Coral Reefs, Canary in the Coal Mine, and I talked about ocean acidification. An artist found some uh, mention of what I was talking about named Ian Bunn. He took my photograph and he acidified it. So that's what I look under ocean acidification. And my husband, if you really want to be depressed, watch his TED talk, How, I, How We Wrecked the Ocean for a True Dose of Genuine Doom and Gloom. And in fact, we became known as Doctors Doom and Gloom on the lecture circuit as a consequence of our activities. On the other hand, about a decade ago, I and others started to realize that just talking about problems without solutions was really counterproductive. In fact, social scientists have known for a really long time, if you give people a really big problem without any way of acting on it, they, it leads to apathy, not action. I mean, basically, people would rather go to the bar than think about a big problem they can't do anything to solve. And, and this has plagued the environmental movement. We've talked over and over again about all the problems without providing the solution. And fortunately, that's starting to change. You see here four titles, which are clearly in the realm of, uh, of thinking about what we can do and what we are doing. And in fact, uh, the two books by Steven Pinker are definitely in that model as well, thinking about what's positive, what, what can we do in light of what's happening. And so we really need and are beginning to move beyond the obituaries. And I'd like to share with you a few examples of what we're doing in the ocean that actually give uh, me and other people hope. One of the first things we have to do is protect what's left. And in the ocean, that's called creating a marine protected area, or MPA. 
And here you see two very, very different MPAs. One created in the most remote, remote part of the planet, Antarctica, and one created in what is arguably the least remote part of the planet, Hong Kong. So on the left, you see uh, the raw, uh, images from the Ross Sea. Now, this was established by an international agreement. It's now the largest marine protected area anywhere on the planet. It was created not just by a scientist acting alone, but by a scientist acting with an artist, John Weller, the photographer you see here. They created a public campaign, they tirelessly lobbied diplomats, and eventually the agreement was signed. Now on the right, you see Mai Po in Hong Kong. Now, Mai Po is wedged between Shenzhen, which you see in the background, and Hong Kong, whose combined population is about 20 million people. And yet, in that tiny sliver of estuary, you can see black-faced uh, spoonbills and all sorts of endangered birds that really depend on this location for their survival. Increasingly, what scientists are doing is not just having one-off marine protected areas, but creating them in networks. And networks are really important because if something bad happens in one place, if there's some place that's connected, then the offspring from that place can repopulate the place that has suffered a catastrophe. And the way these networks are being created increasingly involves very sophisticated scientific analysis, not only in terms of the amount of connectivity that exists today, but what the vulnerability is likely to be in terms of future climate change. And a paper that's coming out shortly that I'm part of uses actually the methods derived from stock market investment to minimize, maximize return and minimize risk in terms of selecting marine protected areas in the context of what likely uh, climate change is going to be. Now, of course, because we've done a lot of damage, we also have to repair things as well. And here you see an image of what's been happening in the Philippines thanks to the Zoological Society of London. You see here a group of people planting mangroves in 2007, and remarkably quickly, by 2012, you actually have a mangrove forest. Now, this looks a little bit haphazard, but like marine protected areas, restoration is increasingly being informed and improved by science. And it's not just restoration of mangroves, which are critically important in terms of uh, providing protection against waves and also as nurseries for fisheries, as restoration of shellfish beds, restoration of seagrasses, and restoration of corals. And in fact, um, the coral restoration work is being uh, uh, very greatly amplified by uh, uh, the possibility of doing genetic, really advanced genetic methods as being studied by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Here's another example of a success story. Uh, that's the recovery of puffins. Now, puffins were decimated by over-harvesting, but that ended at, the, at the, about 1900, thanks to legal action. Nevertheless, decades passed, and the puffins didn't come back. And thanks to Dr. Stephen Kress, who realized that puffins are sort of like people. They don't really like rocks without puffins, and so he put wooden puffins on the rocks. He played puffin calls to the flying puffins flying by, even moved in a few transplanted nestlings. And now puffins have repopulated most of their original zone. And it's a method that's not just used for puffins today, but also by seabirds, uh, for seabirds that nest colonially in a number of different species. And finally, we're doing a much better job of keeping track of what's going and also using that information to plan what we should do in the future. This is a new project called the Global Fishing Watch. You see here the six months of activity in 2015 from China, uh, Japan, and Spain. And this allows countries, particularly those with large amounts of water in their exclusive economic zone, to really manage their fishers properly with the, with the kind of information they have. So much of sustainable fishing is undermined by illegal, unregulated, and unreporting <coughs> IUU fishing. Uh, here's another example of keeping track. This is the work of Barb Block at Stanford. There, her group, a couple of years ago, discovered that most white sharks, for mysterious reasons, travel uh, from California to a middle, an area of the Pacific Ocean called the White Shark Cafe. So last fall, they tagged a bunch of white sharks and then steamed out there for World Ocean Day. They timed it all perfectly and then and found the sharks uh, thanks to high. Uh, technology efforts like these sail drones, which can pick up acoustic signals from the tag sharks, but also using DNA sequencing, environmental DNA, which is essentially like sequencing seawater, uh, and they were able to pick up the DNA sequences of white sharks in the White Shark Cafe as a result of these efforts. And then finally, in terms of keeping track, uh, we're much better in terms of doing things in, in the same thing in multiple places, these networks and networks of networks. And here you see two examples. One is the Autonomous Reef Monitoring Program, or ARMS, and that's me in the background in Saudi Arabia next to a newly deployed uh, uh, unit. These are basically like underwater apartment houses, and um, 
You put them out there for a year, you see what moves in, pick them up, see what moves in, but you see, you see what moves in using, again, these high-throughput DNA sequencing methods that allow you to identify everything in the structure without ever showing it to a taxonomist. It can all be done very quickly and now very cheaply with DNA sequencing. And on the left, you see a scientist engaged in something, an activity associated with something called the Reef Life Survey. This involves, again, fairly low-tech methods, counting what's on the bottom and, uh, and counting what's in the water. But the key is they're doing it all over the world. So the arms have been deployed from Antarctica to Alaska. And similarly, the Reef Life Survey has a global distribution. So when you have the same thing being done in many, many places, it's a much, much more powerful kind of information than if you just do it in isolation. And as a result, for example, it was recently published in Nature, the, the realization that biodiversity is as important as climate in terms of supporting the productivity of ocean ecosystems. And this is uh, really important because productivity is what we eat. That's the fish that we need in terms of providing our protein uh, from the sea. And increasingly, not only do we have these networks of arms or networks of uh, the Marine Life Survey, but then you have networks of networks, such as the Smithsonian's Marine Geo Program and others like it, which try to pull together all these pieces of information. So relatively simple techniques, sometimes as simple as um, just putting out pieces of squid and seeing how quickly they're being eaten. They can be done by school children, citizen scientists, some of them a little bit more sophisticated. But the key is doing the same thing in multiple places. It really gives us the kind of information that we never had before. So now, I've told you a little bit about what we're, some of the bad things, some of the good things. So uh, we were asked to ask you all questions. So my question is for all of you now. My title of my talk was Doom, Gloom, or Optimism for the Ocean. So I want to see a se sense of the room. How many of you feel like we're doomed? All right, we have one, two, three, four people who feel that we're doomed. How many feel like we're not doomed, but it's going to be a pretty miserable place to live in? All right, I have too many people to count. How many people have any kind of cautious optimism about the future? All right, you're less than the doom and gloomers, but you're still a non-trivial number. So let's talk about what we could do in order to get more of you in that last category and few of the, the, those of you in the first two categories. All right, so I was asked to say, what would the oceans and really sustainability science look like in 2030? And this is a question that applied to almost all those whiteboards that were out there during the coffee break. And, my, and it's very difficult to predict. 2030 is a long time away. And uh, Bill Gates, for example, said that we always overestimate the amount of change that happens in two years and underestimate the change that happens in 10. So this is longer than 10. So uh, this is a very cautious prediction. It's more, perhaps more hope. But my hope slash prediction is that we'll combine science with passion to solve a lot of these problems that we face, not only in the ocean, but in land as well. And I don't mean just the passion of scientists, because most successful scientists are passionate. I mean the passion of the general public and policymakers. Because it's great to know that there are 8 million practicing scientists, as we learned this morning on the planet. And there are 50 million people, apparently, on Twitter who have something in their description that suggests that they're interested in science. But if we're going to solve these problems, we need 3 billion people engaged, not 50 million. 3 billion. So how do we do that? The first thing is to remember that science, I mean that sustainability is about people. Now there are lots of we as environmentalists we often talk about tree huggers, but you know most people aren't tree huggers. People are people huggers. That's what people do. People like people. And so that it, in order for sustainability to really be mainstream, people have to realize that it's good for them. It's not just good for the, for the organisms in the ocean or on the land. And that's why, for example, Pope Francis wrote the encyclical that he did about climate change, which I was really proud to be part of the initial gathering of the information. He wrote it because he really cares about people. He cares about the planet's creation. He really cares about people. And similarly, that guy on the left, you're never going to get him engaged in sustainable fishing unless it's not only good for the lobsters, but it's good for him and his family. He has to feed his family that night. He doesn't have the luxury of being sustainable for those of us in this room who would just like to see lobsters in principle. He needs them in practice. So people also, to do that, they need information. And that's been a big part of what I have been uh, trying to do in these various efforts that were alluded to, the hashtag ocean optimism effort on Twitter, or the Earth Optimism Summit that we hosted on Earth Day weekend in, in uh, 2017. So the Twitter effort was really just a, 
the idea of finding success stories out there and flagging them with hashtag ocean optimism so that other people would be more likely to notice them. So here you see a study uh, that was actually published in a scientific journal, an open access journal, as I recall. I think PLOS, but still open access. Um, and then it was written up in the New York Times, but a lot of people don't know about it. And it was the fact that most sea turtle populations are actually recovering. How many of you knew that most sea turtle populations were actually recovering? All right, I don't see a single hand unless you're being really shy. So for that reason, we actually decided to broaden the whole scope of this and think about Earth optimism in general, all the things that we're working on the planet overall. And to do that, we brought together 240 scientists, conservationists, journalists, artists, politicians, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, and we had said you had one job, tell the story of what's working, why it's working, and how to scale it up. And people after that summit told us it had changed their lives because to a person, no one had any idea how many success stories there were out there. And that summit brought them all together. But we need more than just information. We really need stories to tell the information, because scientists are pretty good at even looking at a graph like that, and hopefully most of the graphs in the Frontiers journals don't <laughs> look like that, but even even a really nice graph is not a story. And as my colleague and friend Randy Olson often says, you know, scientists tend to say, and, 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 I found and, this, and that, and that, and that. They don't tell a story. There's no narrative structure. People organize information with stories. And even if you do something as simple as just using and, but, therefore, you create that kind of narrative drive that makes what you're, the messages that you're trying to convey more memorable. And this is particularly crazy not to do in the context of conservation successes, because every one of those has a, a narrative that Hollywood drools over. It's a classic hero's journey, any of you who have done, read, read anything about script writing. And so this is my ultimate dream, which is that we have a platform where we can actually share not just the information, but also the story. So here are just a few stories scattered around that map. This isn't beautiful. This isn't what I imagined at all. I imagined something that's spectacular that you can bore down to expand, find, you can search for turtles, or you can search for solar panels, you can find out what's happening in your neighborhood, you can find out what's happening across the globe, but you can find it. Because I have to say, open science is great, but if you can't find what you're looking for, it does you absolutely no good. And I have to say that as somebody who personally collects success stories around the planet, if I don't write it down or tweet it, even if it's been written up by the New York Times and gotten a lot of press, it is a 48-hour news cycle and it is gone. And try finding it a year or a half later if you sort of remember this general idea about something but you don't actually have the details. And the general public needs this because they need to be inspired. They need to have a vision of what a future might look like that's sustainable. And we can't just keep talking about the problems. We have to talk about the solutions, and we have to give people the examples to inspire their own efforts to make the planet a habitable place. And so I'd like to close with the words of the great US civil rights leader, Martin Luther King. It's worth remembering in his most famous speech. He didn't say, I have a problem. He said, I have a dream. Thank you. Thank you.